Thank you. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. It's such a it's such a joy to be here and to get to talk to Sasha. Um, so we are here to discuss your wonderful new book. Thank you. Uh, and I think, if it's all right with oh, yes. you, we're going to start with a reading and then yes. allow the conversation to sort of grow from there. That sounds great. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Sam. Um, this is from the beginning of the chapter about daily rituals. And the only thing that you have to know for background is that John is the name of my husband. <clears throat> John and I have several small daily rituals. Every morning, he wakes up first, makes a cup of coffee, brings, me the, brings it to me in bed, and I thank him and tell him how wonderful I think he is. This small act of romance sets the tone for our day and, in turn, our life together. Later, when he leaves his office, he texts me, on the way. This still gives me a little thrill, like the feeling of knowing you're going to see your crush. And this, too, is a small ritual. In a sense, everything we do a particular way that holds meaning for us is a ritual, especially when there are other ways it could be done. He could just come home without sending a text, but by letting me know he's coming, I get to enjoy a little giddy thrill. We all have these rituals in one way or another. Maybe it's the route you take to work or the way you prepare dinner for your kids. There's a little narrative that goes along with so many of our daily tasks. When I moisturize my face before bed, I imagine the legends of the Fountain of Youth. That's the story being told in every ad for anti-wrinkle cream. These small rituals give us comfort, offer a kind of rhythm, a reliable pattern, and I think an artificial sense of certainty. If I really can slow the hands of time with a skincare routine, it will be because of science, not magic, if we must delineate between the two. Although doing so can rob us of the thrill of both. When my daughter and I leave the playground or some other place frequented by small runny noses, I ask if she's ready for the magical potion that we put on our hands to protect us from sickness. Antibacterial gel is not usually the stuff of fables, but it could be. Imagine encountering a sect somewhere who devoutly carry small bottles of clear fluid around with them and believe wholeheartedly that rubbing the contents on their hands shields them from danger. We would think they believed in magic. Why don't we, just because we know how and why it works? Why does the provability of something rob us of the thrill of it? Even the coffee John brings me every morning feels like sorcery. Something grows in the earth. It's harvested roasted, ground, and percolated. I drink it, and like Alice, I am changed. It wakes me up, gives me strength and speed, superpowers, really. And at the end of the day, a glass of wine is another kind of potion, another plant that comes out of the earth, is readied by technique and time, and when drunk, has the power to unwind you, let you take a step back, and quell stress. So many everyday rituals amount to a magic trick being performed by biology, technology, or some other branch of science. How different would our daily lives be if we found ways to celebrate even the smallest wizardry in life? Thank you. I was so happy when you told me that that was the message <laughs> that you wanted to read. Not just because um, I, as uh, I also assume many of us here, uh, do go through many of those same yes. rituals every day, from the magic anti-aging <laughs> ritual to the unwinding juice at the end yes. of the day ritual. Um, but I love the fact that there is this sort of larger thread that runs through the entirety of the book about this concept of demystification. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about this a little bit um, before we came out, but the idea that a scientific explanation for something somehow ruins it. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's so, I mean, over the course of human history, so many things that we didn't understand have gotten wonderful, detailed explanations. People spend their lives studying them, and in doing so, 
honor them. I mean, you know, meteorology is an example. Um, or, you know, if, if, and there's something about, you know, I mean, medicine, psychology, all these sort of things that we thought we had mystical or religious or mythological explanations for um, these huge, powerful things that hap- seemed to, you know, happen to us and we couldn't understand why we came up with stories for them. And then as we've been able to unpack them and understand, you know, tectonic plates or whatever, you know, um, we, there's something about that change that while it's wonderful to have a deeper understanding, we lose some of the awe and wonder. Um, and I, wonder, I hope that there's a way to present science, present our deep, intricate understanding of so much of nature, of our place in the universe, um, in a way that still gives us that spine-tingling thrill and that feeling of, like, awe and just a, you disbelief at the grandeur of the universe, of nature, of our place on this earth, um, without necessarily having to bring back a mysticism related to it. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's something to be said for uh, what our role, those of us who are uh, intimately connected with the underworkings of a lot of these explanations, what role do we have and what... um, responsibility do we have as sort of keepers of knowledge to do our part to communicate well and clearly and succinctly. And with enthusiasm. I mean, I think that's such a part of it too. Like if you are lucky enough to have like a couple of great teachers in school who were like still really jazzed about like telling you about like alleles or whatever you know (laughs) that's such a different experience than the experience of like I mean specifically with science education but with anything you know the like okay well this is on the test so you have to memorize it and it's just such a and you know I mean obviously teachers deserve a lot more credit and are really underappreciated. Um, and it's understandable that after 30 years, you might not be as, as jazzed as you were that first day. But I just think that there's something about, if we could sort of harness some of the, I don't want to say showmanship, because that sort of has a, the suggestion of something a little bit nefarious, um, but the, like, enthusiasm and the ability to connect that you often see in very successful religious leaders, you know, if you could have that charisma and sort of bring some of the stuff that feels so, sometimes can feel so intimidating or complicated to us and realize that every one of us in our daily lives, whether it's medicine, technology, even astronomy and biology are being, you know, like we're so intimately involved in these things that we don't always understand. Yeah. So I want to take a step back a little bit. Um, we really we dove right yeah. right in deep there. <laughs> so I want to take a step back a little bit and just talk about the sort of overarching yeah. theme of the book and this concept of ritual and everyday life and yeah. meaning, particularly in a secular existence. Right. What prompted you to write this book? Well, I, about five years ago, I wrote an essay that was really about Um, mortality. And for those of us who don't believe, who are secular, who think that the pathway to understanding is the scientific method, evidence, um, what do we, how do we face mortality? And I lost my dad when I was 14. And the essay was really about um, my parents' papers were going into the Library of Congress. And it felt like this incredible, momentous thing that was in a sort of non-literal way, an extension of his life, and just realizing um, what, you know, that there's no, there's no immortality, there's nothing that goes on forever. Um, And the reaction to that essay made me realize that a lot of people are sort of wrestling with this, and so I started thinking about, well, what are the other elements of of secular life that are sort of difficult when you don't believe? And, you know, what do you, what do you still need that has historically the infrastructure has been religion. And so much of it has been about celebrations, marking time. And the more I read about holidays and traditions and rituals around the world, the more I realized that beneath the specifics of 
a theology or a mythology, um, there are the same events, changing of the seasons, the solstices and equinoxes are astronomical events, and biological events, birth, coming of age, death, these are the processes of being a human being on this planet. And we're all, we were all around the world drawn to these same touchstones, and they're real, and they're tangible, and they're provable things. And if you sort of peel back, um, you can find something that's totally verifiable that's still worthy of celebration. I mean, the springtime holidays you find around the world ha share this theme of, wow, things were looking really bad, but now I think it's going to be okay. And I mean, that is springtime, right? The winter was really hard. We didn't know if we were going to survive, you know, in, for most of human history. And we did. This, let's have a party, you know? And I think that, like, you can sort of start looking at those, those things and still, you know, honor the traditions of your ancestors, of your grandparents, if they're meaningful to you. I, you know, I don't think that you have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. My family has been Jewish for millennia. Um, and, you know, I still light candles um, on Hanukkah. I still light a Yurtzeit candle when it's the anniversary of the death of someone I loved. But I do it not because I think that there's a theological impetus, but because it's just innately, lighting a candle, I mean, it's so, it's also so astronomical, right? It's like we have this yellow star that we go around that is so central to our existence and we can make a little miniature one. And if it's meaningful in a way um, to you, you know, it doesn't have to be um, because it's, it's the way of your ancestors and your sort of it, it, you feel ob obliged, you know? Yeah, and I think there are a lot of personal reasons that people will continue to, um, you know, enjoy these traditions and these rituals, even if it's not necessarily steeped in theology. Absolutely, and any belief system, any pattern, it sits on the shoulders of the immediate previous pattern. You know, mm -hmm. nothing is brand new, mm -hmm. and um, anything we're doing today is connected to something that was connected to some tradition beforehand, and I think any future traditions that get concocted or invented will have to live on top of whatever we're doing right now, and some of that is really, you know, is theological and religious. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I wonder how much of it for you, and I suppose this depends on the particular ritual or tradition at, at hand, but how much of it do you think is connected to people not necessarily having as many opportunities within secular life to build a community outside of work or school? It's or <laughs> that, yes, it's yeah. so true. I mean, right, that is, and I, that is one of the things that I do really long for and like have tried to create in different ways in my life is like it's really hard to congregate if you're secular and not feel like it's a little bit contrived. But the two sort of um, pathways to that, one is I think people do it and they, because they don't think of it as rituals, um, you know, let's say you, I don't know, like Thursday after work, you get a drink with your coworkers or you have Sunday dinner at someone's house. And these sort of patterns that we create in our lives, these rhythms, sort of solve some of that problem. And then I think also, I mean, the thing that I think is most admirable about religious culture is the social pressure to do good works. And I think that those of us who are secular who don't think that there is a grand moral safety net to the universe where, like, you know, bad guys will get their comeuppance and good guys will get their reward. We have to sort of create um, a world that is more just for ourselves. And I think that if we were, we, maybe that is a pathway, with, whether it's, a, you know, where you go volunteer or organize or protest or, you know, anything like that, that can create that sense of community. But it, again, it, because it sort of has to be a little bit steady to really fulfill that need. Absolutely, absolutely. So... Sort of continuing along with that thread, um, so I, uh, along with many people, will frequently refer to myself as a creature of habit. Mm. But it's always done in this sort of like self-deprecating yeah. way, like, yeah, oh, yeah. That, there she goes, going to the bed. the same thing you know? at the restaurant, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Um, and I, I think there's this idea, particularly among young people and young adults, um, about following custom as 
somehow safe or, or easy or antithetic to the concept of individuality. Have you found that dynamic as you've been researching? That's really your interesting. Well, I think the reason that we have rituals and customs is because, as my mother would say, there's no refuge from change in the cosmos. There is, we live on this planet where there is constant change, some permanent change and some cyclical change. And it's very difficult to process, right? People are born, people die, and the seasons change. There's, you know, you see, like, it's like when you see a, someone you know has a kid and you don't see them for a few years and they're a teenager, and it's like you can't wrap your mind around it, you know? And I think that we, I think it's, I think there's so much change that we sort of need to counteract that, maybe emotionally, um, by creating some, some rituals and some customs that feel steady to us. But even the most, I mean, no matter what, the most devout person is still interpreting their belief system in their own life. And so even if you feel like you want to do everything exactly the way your ancestors did it, um, you're, still, you're still an individual, you're still doing it, you're still reinterpreting it. So I don't think that necessarily, like, um, even when we think of ourselves as creatures of habit, mm -hmm. we're still individuals and we're still making changes where we see fit and highlighting the things that are important to us and letting some of the other stuff fall away. And I mean, we do that in every generation. Yeah. Yeah, I, lo I love that idea of... of you know, adopting new traditions within the structure of something that's existed for a long time. And to that end, I do, I want to acknowledge the multiple instances within this book um, wherein ritual or tradition functions as an aid for memory. Mm. It was really fascinating as I, as I read through it, this idea that we use this type of repetition as a way to call back to people or places that we no longer have accessible to us, mm -hmm. either because of distance or something much more permanent like right. death. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, you tell this this really powerful story about including physical objects at your wedding. Oh yeah. For people who could not be there, and you you make an explicit point to say it didn't mean that they were there with you, but right. it did make your memories of them much more present. Right, and I mean, wedding is a perfect example of even if you're totally secular, a wedding is like so, makes it so clear how much we love traditions and rituals and like this symbolic stuff. I mean, it's so, like if you take a step back and it's like, you know, okay, so you get a metal circle, you gotta get two metal circles, and then they, you know, if you were, came from a totally different culture or planet or something like that, and you know, it was like, oh, this, is, this means now they're together, and they put their metal circles on this specific finger for whatever reason, it's like related to like a medieval belief that there was a vein from the ring finger directly to the heart, um, it's not true. Um, and, um, and it's like, it becomes so clear, it's like almost like a performance art piece that we all, I mean, not everyone, but like we so often do. And like the idea that, you know, you, you know, wear a white dress for purity. I mean, I lived with my husband for six years before we got married, but it's like, you know, I, you still go do these traditions that maybe unwittingly um, or maybe very um, clearly are, are, are communicating that you want to extend something, communicate something and, and, and make a metaphor come to life. And so, you know, we had a secular wedding, but we did incorporate some traditions from both sides of our families in a secular way. And then I thought, how can I, how can I sort of have um, a, a, a little personal secret nod to the fact that I really wish that my dad were alive and could walk me down the aisle? Um, and even, again, an, another ritual that I'm like, this is so antiquated. It comes from, like, this very, you know, ridiculous idea of, like, now this woman's your problem. Here you go. <laughs> and, like, you know, and it's like, I don't want to, like, be bound by these ancient things that don't represent um, what I believe. But I also want to, like, you know, be part of the fabric of a community and a culture and, like, you know, have a wedding and have my family come and my friends. And so what I did was I asked my mother for an old 
she had kept a lot of my dad's clothes and I asked her for a necktie and I just wrapped it around my bouquet and I had it under my hands um, as I walked down the aisle. And it's like, it, again, it's not because I felt like, so many people said to me when I was planning my wedding, like, oh, your dad will be with you and will be looking, you know, watching over you. And I don't like always want to like start like a philosophical debate while I'm like whatever, like getting my makeup done or something. Um, and you know, on the day of my wedding, but um, I just, um, so I don't always say like, you know, but my perspective is I, I don't have any evidence to support that. So I don't believe that, but this was a way that I could feel closer to him, not that I could convince myself that he was closer to me, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, is there a difference? <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> it might not be an <laughs> is there a difference between private and public ritual? Oh, it's so interesting. Well, I really do think that public rituals are and I don't mean this at all in a negative sense, but like the, it is a performance art piece and it is for an audience and it is communicating something to the rest of your group, um, which is wonderful. I mean, I think that's really um, useful and kind of amazing that we do it all over the world and it's really powerful. Um, but there is something about a private ritual that seems to be much more about the emotional needs of the person. If you're doing something while you're alone, you know, like, it's not, I mean, if you're religious, you think that, if you believe that, you know, you're doing it for God or your gods, um, then there's another thing. But if you're secular and you're doing a ritual by yourself, I mean, I think that's one of the things that comes to mind is, you know, yoga and meditation come out of theism, but they are taken on this very secular life of their own. And it's like, that's something you do for yourself because mm -hmm. you feel improved by it. And I think that those do serve a different purpose than, than the ones that feel more like they are for the benefit of the larger group. And sometimes you go, you know, I mean, again, a wedding, sometimes you do some of the rituals because, like, you don't want to make your grandmother upset and it's not necessarily, like, what you would choose, but you're like, I don't want to go into the whole thing, you know. And so I think some of that is for the benefit of, of your elder, of your community. Yeah, I do. You know, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I do think there's a certain, there's a certain place where expectation fits and that sometimes there can be a feeling of discomfort from your community when you don't yeah. conform to certain expectations. Right. So, you know, if you elope, right. people are sort of, they don't they take necessarily... They it so personally. Right. <laughs> they get very like, mad they weren't there, or they, right. you know, make weird comments about, where do I send the gift now? You know, right. something like that, right? You know, and our, which is a tradition <laughs> in its own way, aggressive. right? <laughs> right. Well, but that just, I mean, people should be nice when people elope and not give them a hard time. Um, but it just speaks to how powerful these rituals are and like this feeling that like your, whatever, your great aunt is like invested in seeing the performance art piece where you get married and have a party and do these things. And it's like, it's almost like without witnessing the change, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around it. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. well, I didn't see you get married, <laughs> you know? And now you're married. What am I supposed to do with this? Um, and I think, I mean, coming of age rituals are such a thing too, because it's like, right, it's very, it happens slowly. You go from being a child to being an adult. It's not like one day you wake up and you just like, you know, you were a little boy and now you have a full beard and you're six feet tall, you know? <laughs> it happens like really slowly over time. And it's, it's like anything when it's happening so slowly and the changes are so undetectable, we have a hard time realizing it. I mean, it's like trying, like laying on the grass and like trying to feel the earth move, but then you see a sunset and you're like, oh, a day has gone by, you know? And I think the coming of age rituals are this thing where it's like the community comes together and besides just bestowing new rights and responsibilities on somebody, it's also saying like, okay, this person was little and now they're big and now we know they're big now and they're a member of the grown-up part of the community. And I think it's just like the group needs, needs those things sometimes. I don't think people should be like, you know, obliged to do them if they don't feel like them. But I also understand that even in a secular way, you know, all these things that are like, I mean, some of them are secular, like, you know, a sweet 16, but like even like a, a Bar Mitzvah and like, you know, I mean, quinceanera, like we have, there's so many rituals around the world that have this 
um, that mark this transition. And it's a biological transition, right? It's so easy to forget that part of it, but it's like the chemicals in your body change and you have secondary sexual characteristics and it's totally biological and provable, um, but we really feel the need to like acknowledge it and celebrate it. And it's also this way of saying, oh, our group is gonna continue. Maybe you will have babies and then we will live on a little longer. And like that's at the heart of so much of that stuff too. And weddings too. I mean, in the, you know, in a different epoch when it was just totally about producing children, like that's what the idea was. That's why it's worthy of celebration was like the idea of like, well, we're gonna keep going. Yeah. Going back to the way that you set this book up, I really love the structure of it. Um, you've, you've broken it down into these thematic chapters, these 16 chapters, and um, yet it still retains this sense of continuity. It's this sort of combination of like memoir and history and scientific text. Did you, how did you choose the themes that you included in the book? Oh, that's a good question. I, some of it just seemed innate. I mean, there's the four seasons. There's um, birth and death. You can guess which was the first, which is the last chapter. Um, and, you know, and then there's, you know, rituals like, you know, a monthly ritual, a weekly ritual. And then there were things like feast and fast, which just seemed, the, the more I was reading and researching, it was just astonishing to me how many of our rituals are around food and around, I mean, da daily rituals can be around food, but just the idea that so many cultures prescribe a period of fasting and then a celebration at the end. And that also was biological, the, you know, consumption of food, our relationship with the plants and animals that we consume. Um, and so I just, there were just a handful of events that I kept finding throughout my research that seemed, I don't want to say universal because my dad would say, we only have information for this planet, um, but they seemed very popular um, around, around this little world, and, and they're so specific to life on this planet. I mean, the axial tilt of the Earth, right, that's so particular to us, and that's why we have seasons, and our own biology as a species, you know, they're very personal to our little world, um, and, you know, there are probably a handful of other things that are um, that I could have included. A friend of mine said, you should do a chapter on giving, which is also mm. like a big part of so many um, religious um, traditions and something that's really important and I think also has a certain, I mean, this is a whole other conversation, but like, you know, how we've organized ourselves to, you know, and, and what we, in our communities, what we've valued. Um, but yeah, I think it was just a matter of the things that we, so many cultures celebrate and the things that had a real biological or astronomical kernel of real science at the core of them, even though a lot of these traditions predate our understanding of how that science worked. Yeah, it's a really fascinating way to think about how we have this direct connection, no matter where we are, to a particular part of the universe. And thinking about, um, I'm, I'm showing my, my connection to the planetarium yes. right now, but, um, <laughs> this idea of, of looking up and this yes. idea of being connected by our ability to do so and interact with those things, but in very different ways. Yeah. So it's really fascinating to read through and hear about, you know, this is something that we do in this particular season when we're under this particular section of the sky mm -hmm. and the weather is doing this and that and the other. And this is what someone way over here is doing and experiencing. And that we all... I mean, it's amazing that we all, you know, cultures who, you know, thousands of years ago had no possible way of communicating all chose very similar events as the touchstones for celebrations or rituals or mythology is really says so much about us as a species. And I think that now, you know, we're so removed, you know, like looking up at the night sky and living in a city and, you know, all these things that we, we're sort of removed from, but it's mm -hmm. still in there. And, we're, and we still do them in these ways that are sort of indirect. We still have these um, 
really deep connections to our place in, in the universe. And it's so easy for that kind of thing to sound like a little bit like woo-woo, you know. Um, but it's, I, I think that what would be really amazing is if we could start, start sort of taking, just, I mean, if you believe and you are devout, then you have lots of stuff to celebrate. And that is wonderful. But if you're, if you're a skeptic or you're secular or atheist or agnostic, I, I don't think that skepticism should mean pessimism. Mm. And if you think that this is all random chance that any of us are here, you know, then life being alive is so even more astonishing from my perspective than if you think everything happens for a reason and was pre ordained. So I just think that the, the stuff that we really can deeply understand, you know, facts get maligned as, you know, cold and hard, and we have these, like, really negative associations with the things that are um, just verifiably true, but I think that they can be the source of so much of that, like, thrilling, wonderful celebration and connection. You know, and I think, I think there's a period of time in which they are, mm -hmm. and it's such a it's such a joy to to work in a space where people are having those yes. those moments, and to actually be able to sort of walk through as yes. I'm going down to you know the basement cave where I work, but yes. actually seeing people who are really excited yes. about learning and having yes. moments where they didn't know something and now yes. they do, and it changes them yeah. profoundly. Yeah. But their reaction isn't necessarily to have a very introspective moment and say, I'm marking the time that I learned this. Right, it's right. something like, wow, or yay. But even that is so great, and it's like, I mean, it's kind of a cliche, but it's like you see it so much with little kids, mm -hmm. and like, I have a two-year-old, and like, she freaks out when she sees <laughs> the moon. She can't believe it. She is so, like, a big, full, beautiful moon is like, I mean, it's like, a, she's, it's like an emergency. She's like, moon, moon, moon. And like, we all have to go to the window and look at it and talk about it. And like, it's so easy to be like very blasé and be like, yeah, it orbits us. It's always, you know, it's like such, you know, why now? Um, but it's like, <laughs> if you can sort of tap into some of that enthusiasm and um, beauty, you know, finding the beauty in these things that are so, you know, we also just get used to stuff as we mm -hmm. get older. And I think there's something about like, um, you know, defamiliarization, like taking that step back where you think, wow, I mean, like the antibacterial gel, where you're like, wow, this is kind of incredible that we have this. And I, I mean, I have a cold right now, so I haven't been, I need to be using the antibacterial gel more. But like this idea that we can carry around this thing that helps us and protects us. And you know, over the eons, we've had so many things that we've created that require faith to think how they work. And it's like, this really works, whether you believe or not. And there's so, there's so much beauty in that. And so, so much I think we can get out of that kind of thing. I'm so glad you brought up the example of the moon because it reminded me of, you know, to sort of come back to this concept of social media and public yeah. and ritual. You know, I love the idea of, of a two-year-old seeing the moon and yeah. being like, moon, moon, moon. And we do that. Yes. You know, I'm yes. 32 years yes. old. <laughs> and yet you see the moon yeah. and it's, then you scroll through Instagram and see yeah. everybody's blurry yes. moon pictures because they're all like moon, yes. moon, moon too, yes. which is perfectly socially acceptable totally. for us. Whereas if I ran up to a stranger on the street and said, moon, moon, right. moon, they right. would probably be a little weird. Right, right, right. <laughs> Defense, maybe you would totally. <laughs> or maybe be, they'd be really be, excited you're too. your best friend, right? Um, but I, yeah, I think that's so true. And that there is also something about like social media where it's like, well, you know, I mean, obviously it's a double edged sword in mm -hmm. a lot of ways, but there is this way in which, um, you know, it can, it, if you're the only person in your town who thinks something or feels a certain way, and like the idea that, well, you can find somebody who lives maybe on the other side of the planet who feels the same way, and if that's the way that you get your community, and that's the way that you get that sense of being part of a congregation, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's really fantastic too, because otherwise it can be really isolating if you don't feel like you're in a place physically in a place where other people are also excited about the moon or whatever it is that, you know, that it's you're always saying. The moon. It's always yeah. the moon. But it's just, I mean, it is like, obviously we have electrical lights now and that have changed things a bit. But like, I mean, certain things like the sun and the moon, I mean, 
you know, it just seems like if you're going to worship anything, and I'm not like saying <laughs> that that's like how we should operate, but it just makes perfect sense, right? And we've had so many sun gods and moon, very, very often goddesses um, all over the world across human history. And it's just like, it makes perfect sense. We're, I mean, we're so dependent on the sun, the moon, like in, with no electrical lights in the dead of night, imagine what a relief it was to have that light. And it's just like, I mean, it's just intrinsically really powerful and beautiful. And yeah, everybody should be like, moon, moon, moon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hashtag moon, moon, moon. Yeah. Um, here we are. So who of the, you know, moon enthusiasts yeah. and people who live secular lives or people who appreciate, um, religious ritual without necessarily feeling comfortable there. Did you, did you write this book for a group of people in particular? Or? There's, there's two groups of people I sort of had in mind um, as I was writing. One is, you know, people who sort of identify as spiritual but not religious. Because I think it's very easy for, to get sort of swept up in some pseudoscience and some things like I'm just going to say it, astrology, um, that like people crave this connection to our place in the universe and like, you know, they want to feel like they're part of this enormous grandeur. And I think some, there are some things that are sort of in the pseudoscientific category that um, you can get swept up in um, because you want to feel connected. Um, and I hope that this book can provide a different pathway where you can feel connected to the stuff that's actually supported by scientific evidence um, and still get that sense of, like, I'm part of this vast grandeur. Um, and the other group of people I thought about a lot, um, perhaps selfishly, is parents of small children. And because I think if you're, you know, when you start to plan a family, you have to decide for yourself you know, with your partner, what are we going to celebrate? What are we going to emphasize? What are we going to, um, what traditions are we going to carry on? What new traditions are we going to start? Um, and how are we going to ask these, like, really deep philosophical questions that children always ask in time? And I think even if you're religious or you're, one partner is religious or you come from different religious backgrounds, um, you have to, even if you come from the same exact cultural, religious background, like the family you grew up in, there's going to be some difference um, with your partner. And you have to sort of sort these things out um, and figure out how you're going to answer these questions and how you're going to, like, what are you going to do um, to mark time and celebrate? Um, and how are you going to do those things? And I think um, it's really easy to just sometimes go through the motions of the stuff that you were brought up with if you, because you feel like, well, what are we going to, like, not have Christmas? I don't know. You know what I mean? Um, and I just think that there's a way to approach it that where you can still honor your family's traditions, but also carve out something new that represents what you really, like, your own actual philosophy and worldview. So I think we have time for, oh. for selfishly, for me to ask one yes. more question before we turn uh -huh. and, and um, invite people to, to ask questions as well. So you are now on a book tour. Yes. <laughs> have, as you've met people and had conversations with people, have any of them um, opened up to you about traditions that they hold that might have been surprising or interesting? Yes. Oh, my goodness. I was in San Francisco. Like, I don't know if that was like two days ago or a month ago, I'm a little, <laughs> little jumbled. Um, but I was in San Francisco and um, this gentleman, per perfectly dignified looking gentleman said, um, you know, um, I have a five-year-old and every night before bed, my wife and my five-year-old and I howl together like oh and like I and and like that's that's our nightly ritual um and I mean and I was like that's amazing that's so fantastic but it's like we're all doing these I mean maybe not howling but we're all doing something where you maybe don't see it as a ritual but it has some meaning to you and it's like this little family where you know the mom and the dad and the little boy do this very like you know animal like mammalian but not 
primate thing um, every night before bed. And it's like, they're together. I mean, it's a perfect little metaphor of like, we're a little pack together and we're in it together. And, um, and it's just like a way of saying like one day has ended. And it just seems so adorable to me, but also made me really realize that like, you know, it's, we're, we're all doing those things. And I'm really, I write in the book about um, my husband and I sing the alphabet song every Saturday um, because we were in a taxi cab once and the taxi driver was like, you have to sing. To, I mean, he like broke out into, he did like a Janis Joplin medley. We were like, <laughs> what is happening? And he was like, you have to sing together. And we were like, we're not like show folk, you know, we don't <laughs> sing. Um, and he was like, you have to, because it's like really important that you be silly together. And he was like, A, B, C, D, sorry, my voice. And we were like, E, F, G. And by the end of it, we were like, me, the three of us were like just belting out the alphabet song and he was like, sing it every week. And we were like, okay. And it's been like six years and we do it. And, um, and it's like a little silliness too, I think is really important. I mean, religious rituals tend to be like really, um, you know, s serious and somber in certain ways. Um, but I think just like bringing down your defenses with a, something a little bit funny, a little bit silly is also really special. It's your howling. Yes, exactly. <laughs> howling. Everyone at the moon, perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> brought it back. Brought it back Full to the circle. Moon. <laughs> well, I think um, it's probably time to, to turn to questions from our audience, if Great. anyone is... Hi, everyone. Great. So we've got some mics circulating the audience. Before we get started, just a few things. Please make sure to speak into the mic. Keep your question brief. And please pose your question as a question rather than a statement. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and start right up here. You gave lots of positive rituals. Did you discover lots of negative ri rituals that you can't understand? Uh, why they exist or why people do them? There are certainly lots of rituals that are um, really unfortunate and negative. I, the, the only one I think I discuss in the book is um, m my mother told me that like when there's a Jewish tradition, when a young woman gets her period for the first time, she gets a slap in the face, which was horrifying to me when I learned that, and I did include that. And you're right, there are lots of really um, disturbing rituals around the world, we, you know, in, in all cultures, but I didn't go into that in the book because um, I think that my hope is to emphasize the things that we share that are really positive and it seems like the specifics of the horrible things we do as a species to each other are a little bit different in every place, but the things that we do that are beautiful um, we share. So my hope is not to emphasize the stuff that's really disturbing, but to sort of um, celebrate the things that are beautiful that we share and try to move us a little bit more in that direction. Thank you. Let's go right down here. Uh, thank you for a lovely talk. Uh, thank you. I grew up in India. There's no country that has rituals like the Indians. We joke <laughs> that every day is a holiday because yeah. somebody's celebrating yeah. something. So, I mean, you test, touched on the secular and the religious, and I think that's really important. In India, everybody's religious and secular at the same time. Yeah. Uh, I, as a Sikh, have celebrated in all kind of Hindu temples, in yeah. the churches, even with my Muslim friends. So we all celebrate each other's holidays together. So that has enormous benefit once it really reduces the religious tension because we don't think of places of worship as mine. So mm. one of the strange things, I tried to make a speech that when I came here, when people said, this is my church, uh, I, it's, mm. it is so unknown in India that anybody would say, this is my temple. Right. So no place of worship is considered belonging to a person. So what I'm trying to say is that if we combine, because religion is where most of our you know, rituals come from, and we make them more secular rather than religious, and we invite all our friends and yeah. everybody to participate, 
that will have benefit of giving us more positive rituals, as you've been saying, reduce religious tension so that we understand each other's culture and religion better. Yeah. Yes, I, I think that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And I also think, I mean, it's true for, if you've ever been like, you know, on vacation somewhere, or like, I don't know, like I'm not Catholic, but like when, like in Rome and you like go to see these amazing churches and like you see the art and you see all of this beauty and like I'm not attending mass there, but I can see this like, you know, these, you know, anywhere in the world you travel, a grand temple, you know, these soaring minarets, whatever it is, you can get some of that, the beauty, and feel connected to a group that maybe you're not a part of, and, you know, feel comfortable going in, and even if you're not there for the religious portion, feel connected to, to another tradition. We have a question here in the center. Um, I was an anthropology major, oh. so I studied a lot of this international um, c cultural comparison stuff. But um, I was just curious, how much actual research did you do in other cultures, and did you actually travel to other countries? Cultures? I, it, um, the vast majority of it was reading, not going. I wish I could have gone more places, but the vast majority of it was, was reading, um, opposed to being there in person. We have another question in the middle. Do you think rituals are gonna change severely or disappear with new generations? You know, now young adults, they don't think about raising kids, they might be raising dogs. <laughs> uh, so what do you think about what's gonna happen in the future? And what can we do as parents, as grandparents, as educators to keep those important rituals? Um, that's a great question. I don't think that rituals will go away. I think they will change because they change with every generation in some way. But I think that, um, yeah, I think holidays and rituals, I think, will have to be reinterpreted because they are always being reinterpreted. Um, and in terms of, like, what, how to, like, handle that, I just think the, um, the more that you, like, let children figure out for themselves what they believe and what they want to do. And maybe you say, like, look, this is what we're doing. Um, but answer questions. I mean, my, I write in the book about how, like, one of the things that was most meaningful to me is, like, my when I was a child, like, if I asked a question that my parents didn't know the answer to or, like, a complicated like, um, you know, difficult philosophical question, like what happens when you die, like that kind of stuff. Um, my parents were so thrilled for me to ask a hard question. And sometimes it was something that we could go look up in the Britannica, and sometimes it was, you know, questions to which no one has the answer. Um, but I think that encouraging children to like, you know, basically, like anyone, you, no one wants to be forced. And, you know, if you make whatever you're doing really exciting and fun for them, but saying, look, you're going to have to figure out for yourself what your own philosophy is, I also think, you know, it, you tend, <laughs> people are more, kids are being more inclined to, to just naturally come back to what they loved um, when they were little versus feeling like they're obliged, and then it makes it less fun. We've got a question over here to your right. Did your mother and father have any rituals that they passed on to you that were of the idiosyncratic howling variety? Oh, well, we, yes. So my mom would do, so it's, so we would do like a secular Passover, um, but we also had another springtime holiday, um, which was, um, there was a dogwood tree that we could see from her, our dining room window, and every spring we would like wait for it, for the first little buds to show, and like every morning get up and examine it, and then, you know, in April at some point when it would bloom, um, my mother would have a little tea party for me called Blossom Day, um, and it was sort of just like this, and just celebration of like, it's springtime, and it didn't require any dogma, um, but it just was innately good, like the weather's going to get better, and everything's blossoming, and the days are longer, and um, so that was one that I really, I mean, it's not quite on the level of the howling or the alphabet song in terms of <laughs> idiosyncratic, being idiosyncratic, but um, but that was really special for me, and it really taught me that you can sort of, you know, you can sort of concoct something new, and it can be just as special as the stuff you've been doing for 
I don't know, 6,000 years. <laughs> we have a question here in the center. Oh, yeah. All right. As you did research for your book, what were some of the favorite rituals that you came yes. across? And were there any rituals that you decided to adopt in your own life? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't think there's anything that I've adopted that I didn't already do, partly because it's like, it's a very fine line with like appropriation um, or not, but with one of my very favorite talking about performance art pieces, you know, one of my very favorite um, rituals that I um, researched for this book was a coming-of-age ritual in Vanuatu, which is in the South Pacific, about a thousand miles off the coast of Australia, and it's called land diving. And it's something that men do. Um, they climb to, like, the top of a platform in the trees, and you, like, you know, um, tie pliable vines to your ankles and you jump off like a bungee cord. And the first time that you do it as a young man, your family gathers around, you know, on the ground and cheers you on, your community cheers you on. And it's this coming of age thing where you jump off into the unknown and then you come down and you're fine and um, your family celebrates you and then your mother destroys your favorite childhood object, which... <laughs> I was like, this is the most, if all of these things are metaphors about these human experiences, I was like, this is the most, to me, most brilliant metaphor about adulthood. And it's just like, you have to jump off into the unknown, you have to let go of something that made you feel safe, and just, and then everyone says like, hey, you did it, great work, and now you're an adult, and you're, you know, you have a different role in society, but it was just like this perfect thing of like, I don't know, it seemed to transcend, like it didn't, I mean, there is like some like, you know, there's like a story behind it, but it sort of didn't need that um, to be really relatable, I thought. Got it, Kelly. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you for writing this book and coming to speak today. Thank I you. I have two questions. Um, were there any rituals that... Um, you found that kids instigated or young children instigated oh. in their families rather than coming from the adults. And my second question is kind of a follow on to this previous one. Um, do you have any thoughts or suggestions to, that you came across in your research or just on your own, you know, regarding keeping the interest of teenage and young adult children in family rituals? Oh, um, Thank you. it's a really good question about things that kids instigated. I think, you know, I think you, you find those things in like what they're curious about and what, and then it becomes like, okay, we went, we go to the aquarium every weekend because, you know, she's really interested in the octopus or whatever it is. And I think it's like, it's, it, it doesn't have, in, in what I found, it doesn't have the same like sort of um, theological or, or philosophical thing, but it's just their curiosity. And so often that leads to something that, you know, maybe it seems unrelated at the time, but becomes part of their, their life. But that's a really good question about like kids just being like, okay guys, we're doing this now. I mean, I don't know how the howling started. So maybe it was the, <laughs> the little boy, but in terms of how to keep, I mean, my daughter's only two, so I am not an expert yet on teenagers and I may eat these words in some time. Um, but I, I don't know, my mother was like a really a big believer in um, like reverse psychology and child rearing and she would like act like she was really uninterested in like you know me like the gossip at middle school and I would tell her everything that everyone was doing and like she would bring me like one string bean on a dish and be like you can have as much candy as you want but you can only have one string bean and I'd be like I need more vegetables and she'd be like I guess <laughs> anyway so <laughs> maybe this is like totally doesn't apply to this situation um, but in my mind I would I would say you know just not forcing anyone to do anything and say, look, this is what we're doing. Um, you are more than welcome to join us, but you don't have to, like, you know, go to this or do this. And, and Or maybe ask them what they're interested in, and maybe they have some totally different philosophical um, view and say, okay, well, we can go explore that together, but can you come with me to this? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Great. And we've got a question right over here. Hello. Oh, should I say it? 
Um, I have a question. I know that in your talk today, you've discussed a lot about um, secular versus non-secular type of rituals. However, I am curious to hear your perspective on rituals that impact society and the political climate today mm. and how people... Um, how people process those rituals um, because so many identify personally yeah. with things that contribute to a bipartisan divide. And so yeah. looking at the current political climate and society as a whole, how can we identify these rituals within ourselves, but also not ostracize or condemn people of, of opposing rituals and views uh, when it comes to society and politics? That's such an interesting question. I mean, it's so much of it has to do with identity in both cases, right? And it's like, I see myself as a member of this group. And so, the, you know, the things that are opposing, you know, threaten my view of myself in some way. I think, I mean, one of the rituals that I actually talk about in the book, which is not really religious, but I think is really important is questioning. And I talk about Independence Days mm -hmm. um, as, you know, these national rituals around the world. Um, and like the idea that, um, and also Days of Atonement, you know, rituals about apologizing, where it's like these, these, I mean, Independence Days come from the idea that someone said, wait a second, like we're paying taxes on all this tea and we don't get to, and like he's in charge, wait a sec, you know, and like questioning how, um, you know, the, the powers that be or the status quo, um, and you know, that's something that's also central to science is saying how, why is this like this? Do we have to do this this way? Does this have to be this way? Does the thing that we've assumed for centuries, is that actually true, you know? And I think that, I think that if we can, it's very difficult, but if we can all, um, and especially encourage small children to like ask difficult questions and make that almost, almost a ritual and almost a sacred thing where it's like, even if, even if it doesn't seem, you know, even if whatever we see as normal or whatever, you know, our worldview is, our perspective, um, question ourselves and say, well, why do we think this? Why do we feel this way? Um, why do we assume that this way is right and that way is wrong? Is it just because from childhood we've been told this? Does it have any intrinsic truth to it? And I think that we could maybe get a little bit further and shut down a little bit less in those conflicts if we um, have the ability to, to just, even just privately, take a step back and not be afraid when the answer is, I mean, that we're wrong sometimes. I mean, that's so much a part of it too, and it's such a huge part of scientific discovery is that sometimes you have to face that what we've been thinking all along was wrong and move forward and, you know, change course to get closer to reality. Um, and I think that if we could sort of celebrate that a little bit more and be a little bit less afraid to admit when we're wrong um, and a little bit more willing to value actually getting further, getting closer to a deeper understanding rather than just sticking to our guns, we might be able to get there, hopefully. And on that note, we are out of time, unfortunately, but please join us in a lobby for a book signing with Sasha. Thank you, Sam. Thank you.